Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Committee of the Whole on Bill 259-35 is now called to order. I would ask the, uh, I will introduce the panel uh, uh, that's before me on my left and my right. I'll start with Chief Steve Ignacio from the Guam Police Department. I have Angel Sablon, the Director of the Guam Municipal uh, Mayor's Council. I have uh, Steve Guerrero from the Office of Finance and Budget. To my immediate right is uh, Tom St. Augustine from the Guam Election Commission and his staff. I would ask the uh, panel to please rise and you'll be sworn in. Mr. Chair, Madam point Senator. of order. This is a, an appropriation bill and the whole reason we're going into Committee of the Whole is to get the fiscal information, especially from the government of Guam. And so I'm noting, I, I see OFB is here, but we don't have any representation from the administration regarding the fiscal impact as uh, in BBMR. Yes, ma'am. Uh, they submitted a, a letter uh, after the panel is sworn in, then I will read the letter to, to make it a matter of record, their testimony in reference to this bill. Okay? And we'll get all of me to, to comment about the fiscal note on that one. Would the panel please rise? Questions for the panel. Questions for the panel will be asked in two rounds, unless there's an objection. Okay, two rounds. If we need another round, then we'll, we'll move to the third round, if need be. Yes, Senator. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, is there any word? I mean, obviously we see something from BBMR, uh, but is there anything from the Attorney General's office? I contacted the Attorney General's office and they advised me they will reach out to the Acting Attorney General, Fred Nishiara. I've been calling his phone, but I haven't got a response. I'm hoping they'll still make it soon. And we can ask Tom, our Sergeant Arms, to continuously call the Attorney General's office to follow up for their attendance. All right? There'll be a five minute time limit per senator. We could extend it as, as needed. Amendments must be submitted in writing and via email to the clerk, legal counsel, before the motion to amend is on the floor. If you have your amendments ready prepared and you already submitted it in, then we'll move on from there. I would ask Mr. the- Mr. Chair, can you clarify? Are we gonna do amendments on our first two rounds or in the third round? It, 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 it could be on during the rounds if you want. If you have an amendment, you wanna- We're not gonna add on. use that time with the panel. I beg your pardon? We're not gonna use our first round just to Make use of the panel while they're here, and then release them. We can we do, do both. Okay. I'm very flexible. If time allows, we'll, we'll allow all the questions of the panel, and then we'll move on to the uh, to the amendments. Because more than likely, when the amendments are introduced, you may, my colleagues may want to ask the panel their opinion of the of the amendments, and then we can move. We can do combination of both. All right. So I'd ask the sponsor of the bill to make her opening uh, on the bill so that we're all reminded of why we're on the Committee of the Whole. Senator, Vice Speaker, Acting Speaker, Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I called the legislature into session, uh, an emergency session at this time to, to address the, the uh, welfare of the people. Um, Perhaps what one may see as an emergency may differ from what I see as an emergency. Um, however, at this time, at this very peculiar time, we cannot ignore that the people of Jonia has gone without a mayor for several months now. And we cannot ignore the fact that um, The reality is, is that we know that drugs are being trafficked through mailboxes in Jonya. Whoever is responsible of it, that has not been proven. But we know that the drugs exist. The reality of it is we had DEA tell us the street value of crystal methamphetamine ice has gone down significantly. 
If we continue to not, to not address the concerns of the people and pretend like these issues are not present, then this creates, I believe, this creates uh, a climate of fear for the people of our island. We see it all the time in the news, but where's, where's, um, but where, when are we going to acknowledge it? Apparently, the administration feels like there's an issue, a public safety issue on our island because they're committing to hire 100 police officers. And so, how do we move forward from here? Unfortunately, the connection between the drug trafficking through the mailboxes in Jonia is linked directly to, the, to why we are here. And so, if this isn't an emergency situation, if, if the people of Jonia are okay with being status quo and having no mayor, then what do we need mayors for if a municipal planning council can make these kinds of determinations? But there's two sides of this, this, this picture. There's a division here. We have one saying, allow the process to take place. We don't need to recall. And then we have another side of the community saying, we need a recall. We've lost trust in our elected leader. And so this bill is proffered to give the people a choice. Whether they want to choose to have a recall, they have that right in the voting booth. They're even saying that there's fear of retaliation because I have to put my name and address on a petition saying I want to recall the mayor. And I've, we're seeing how far the reach is, the influence. And so now we're given the people a God-given right opportunity to be born under this flag, the right to vote, the right to discern whether they want to recall or to not recall. And that's really what we're here for. There's an absence of leadership. And I, f I believe that we have heard enough. Uh, we've heard testimony. We've had two town hall meetings. Uh, in the first town hall meetings, there was about 30 to 40 people. And two came up saying that they were able to um, move forward without a mayor. So the question is, do we need a mayor? in all the villages, and another individual said, give the people an opportunity, those that gave, gave testimony, give the people an opportunity to re-elect a mayor or to decide whether they want to recall or not because people are in fear of signing the petition. Another individual who was the former chief of police said, there's a public safety issue overall in our island community. So here we are, you know, the, the debate really should be focused on, are we going to allow the opportunity for the people of Jonia to decide whether they want to move forward with the recall and a special election because of the absence of leadership that's connected to so many other things that we don't want to talk about because we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to, we don't want to acknowledge these things or are we going to address the situation at hand? So it's very clear that there's a void of leadership. It's very clear that uh, there's an inability to perform as a mayor. So now it is, uh, I feel that we should act on this and, and allow the people their God-given right to vote whether they want to recall or not. And then we can say we've done our job as policymakers, as a legislative body, because the people called on us for help. The people are asking us for help. And when, when leaders, elect, most especially elected leaders, void, void the voice of the people when they are calling for help, a lot of things begin to unfold. We've seen it in, in New Orleans, we've seen it in LA, we've seen rioting happen because now there's a fear in the community that they're not being protected. And so Mr. Chair, I, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to speak and um, this is a very uncomfortable position we are in. Um, we, you know, in some way or form, maybe some of us are connected to, you know, relationships, you know, um, pure relationships with individuals and 
And so I know there's a big conflict here for, every, for a lot of us that we face. And um, you know, however this session goes, at least we can say that we've worked to address the people's concerns today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For my colleagues and for the, for the people of Guam, I received an email, and so did uh, the acting speaker receive. It's from um, the office of BBMR. It reads, Alpha Day Vice Speaker Nelson and Senator Sinoxian. I understand, this is from uh, Lester L. Carson, Jr., the director of BBMR. I understand that COW, Committee of the Whole, has been convened for Bill 259. BBMR has provided its physical note on Bill 259 and, specific, and specifically on the fund source. BBMR's position remains firm on any bills seeking to appropriate FY 2019 funds. We are in a deficit and these funds are not available. BBMR is currently working on FY 2021 executive budget submission and unavailable to attend, participate in the Committee of the Whole. I did want to take this opportunity to inform you of BBMR's continued stance on appropriations with a similar funding source prior to session resuming. Thank you, Lester L. Carlson, Jr., Director of BBMR. I open now questions from my colleagues. Point, yes, point Madam order, Senator. Mr. Chair, just like to restate my objection that we are in Committee of the Whole because it is a f um, an appropriation bill and it is the fiscal information that I think is the most important that, uh, I mean, it, it would, it's what brings us into Committee of the Whole. And um, I don't think that the summary statement by BBMR that they are not available, they're not going to attend, that we are in a deficit and these funds are not available is, is enough. And um, we should be able to ask them details again because the last time they appeared before us was when you had a, um, what was that meeting called? The um, the the SES. SES. Right, the special economic. Yes, special uh, economic service uh, where they came in and told us the me numbers at that time, and they all said it was preliminary, and we were waiting until further down the road, and we are now further down the road, and so I think we should be entitled to firm information from the administration, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, Senator, and, and you're correct, because during the budget, they did identify that the uh, unappropriate money may, may reach as much as 27 million. That's how we were able to pass in the budget 10 million to go to GMH. And then the, supposedly the numbers went down. But I'd ask, uh, I'll pass that to um, the OFB to respond, but I'd ask any of my colleagues, do you have any questions on the panel? Because I know that there were some questions posed during the hearing. Senator Chalai, you had a question to the Guam Election Commission in reference to the result of their board meeting. You may want to ask them that question. And I know that Senator Tello, you had a question about the health and welfare and safety of Jonia. So I'll, I'll, I'll begin with Senator Therese. If you want, I'll have Senator Tello ask the first question. I'll, I'll start with Senator Tello. Okay. Okay. All right. Senator Tello. Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone, for being here. Sorry it's been just a last-minute call, but I greatly appreciate you being here, especially you from the mayor's office, um, Angel, for, for being here. You know, first, many of us disagree why we should even have an emergency session because it's not considered an emergency session. It, there's no life at risk. I mean, during, throughout the whole island, we have a drug epidemic. You know, when, when drugs are selling at the lower price than it was a year ago, there, there is definitely a drug epidemic. It's not just happening in one village, but it's happening in all our villages. And it needs to be said that in the event there's a robbery, if there's um, any kind of disturbance, a shooting, the first person you're supposed to call is 911 and the police department. You don't call the mayor's office when there's a public safety issue, you call the police department first and foremost. So it's been stated here that Jonya is in, in array. It's in um, so much disorder. There's so much crime happening, happening in Jonya when 
actually, I've been told by a junior residents that ever since um, the mayor had been in this predicament or, or been placed into custody, that there have been more police officers now in Jotnia patrolling the area. That's what this constituent told me as well. So being the chief of police, which again, I appreciate you being here, are you seeing any kind of emergency in Jotnia with the safety and welfare any different from any other village in Jonia right now, Chief? Uh, Senator Tairigui, uh, thank you for that question. And I did uh, have a chance to briefly look at at least reported crimes uh, to the Guam Police Department. And so the, the, the peak for Jonia was 43 total crimes reported, and I think that was in April. And uh, as of December, uh, I, I think they're at 31 or 33 total crimes reported. Uh, throughout the past 12 months, from January to December of 2019, uh, the village of Jonia has kind of remained flat. Uh, they're somewhere in the mid-30s uh, as far as total crimes reported to the Guam Police Department. So it uh, has declined? Uh, it's flat. You know, there's no significant spike that I've seen in the, in the crimes reported uh, to the Guam Police Department. Uh, we're working on calls for service, but that's a little bit more tedious work to, to get to. Uh, with, with respect uh, to your, the constituent pointing out that there is an increase in the presence of the police department, uh, that, of course, is uh, part of what we do, but it, it's also precipitated by the fact that there was a request by uh, Mr. Angel Sublon from the Mayor's Council of Guam uh, for us to increase uh, our presence there. And I think, you know, Senator uh, Therese Terlai pointed out that she hasn't seen an increase in, in our presence in the village of Jonia. Okay. And uh, there, there also was a request uh, submitted directly to my office from a constituent in Jonia, uh, raising concerns about the lack of police presence. So uh, we, like everybody else, we, we address the needs of the community uh, as equally and fairly as possible. That last comment that you made when there's a request to have more presence of police protection in a village, not only Jonia, but other village, uh, villagers uh, from other jurisdictions has, has also called and made those requests too. Is that true? Yes, yes. So, okay. so we, get, uh, we, we get routine, routinely get calls from different constituents throughout the island. Around the, the island. For the increase of uh, pre police presence, patrols. Okay, well I thank you so much for that and I'm hoping the public hears that, you know, Jonia is fine and it's being well protected. Now the next question I have, um, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I really was hoping that the Attorney General's office would be here to answer my, uh, my next question. And this is in the Guam Code Annotate. Maybe Angel, since you've been there um, in Jotnia overseeing, and, and I, I know you, you're very diligent in uh, researching certain things and what you can and cannot do, and of course being there to help the good people of, of Jotnia as well. In Title V, Article One, Section 40110, have you had an opportunity to read this law in the Guam Code annotated on vacancies? And I'm going to I'm going to read it for the for everyone here. I'm going to skip over where it says Section A, Vice Mayors, because we know that Jonia there is no Vice Mayor, and go straight into. Letter B, it says mayors, if by any reason of death, resignation, removal from office, inability or failure to perform, there shall be a vacancy in the office of the mayor less than 240 days before the date of the, new, the next general election for mayors and vice mayors. It shall be filled by a vice mayor in the municipality where there is a vice mayor, and there shall be a vacancy in the position of the vice mayor until the end of the term. In a municipality where there is no vice mayor, and the vacancy is less than 240 days before the date of the next general election for mayors and vice mayors, the vacancy shall be filled by the majority vote of the municipal planning council of that municipality in which the vacancy occurs, subject to the advice and consent of Les Latura. 
Have you had an opportunity to read this section of law, Angel? Okay. So if there's an issue. Yes, Senator, many times over. Okay. I've read that section of, uh, of chapter 40, Title and, Five. And at the beginning of this whole issue, the problem was that there was no municipality in place in Chonia. Is that true? Well, even at that time, um, the appointment uh, of a name to be suggested as an acting mayor to the legislature doesn't happen until we're 240 days away from the general election. So even at present, even if they had an MPC when the mayor was detained, they wouldn't have the opportunity to name anybody because that doesn't kick in till we're 240 days away from the general election, which is March 8. Test one, two. My test one, two. Okay. Sorry, Angel, I've been, I was uh, interrupted by that. I, if you could just repeat that again so everybody understands what you just said. The provision where the village's MPC selects a name by majority vote to be submitted to the Guam legislature only happens after the 240 day deadline from the general election, which is March 8. Anytime before then, the MPC still cannot name someone, unless of course, by the reasons you gave, death, resignation, incapacitation or whatever those four provisions are. Uh, I did ask the Attorney General, I know that Senator Teresa Lai has a copy of that opinion. They were not very definitive in answering the question of what happens if a mayor or vice mayor is in detention. Their answer was that's not part of the provisions that are included in statute to declare a vacancy in the office of mayor or vice mayor. So that being said, are you aware that um, there has been an appointment letters given to individual residents in Jotnia to serve currently on the council? I am aware because I prepared the memo to the uh, mayor's attorney to please assist us in getting the mayor to uh, sign those appointment letters. And these appointment letters were not at my request or the staff at the Jotnia mayor's. It was at the mayor's request calling our administrative assistant in Jonia. And of those appointed letters, how many people in Jonia have accepted um, the appointment to sit on this council? Well, there were 10 appointments, all 10 accepted. Of course, uh, Senator Peter Tolai was one of those appointees, but he has since uh, declined the appointment. So there are now nine accepted members. So now we have a council put together by the residents of Jonia. These are all residents of Jonia, the people of Jonia, who represent their village. So that being said, then once the 240 days kicks in, it gives them the opportunity at that time to appoint somebody in place of the, the mayor that's not there. Now remember, at the section, the, the, the part in this law that says, by death, resignation, removal of also, or inability or failure to perform. Okay, so that alone can be, well, can be uh, decided upon by the council. Not necessarily, Senator. I did ask the AG that same question, that inability to perform. Their answer back to me was, being in detention doesn't mean that they can't perform. Yeah, I think we had the same example at the Guam Election Commission. They had a meeting last night that I attended, and there was a section there that uh, they, the, their legal uh, said that sometimes someone doesn't have to be at the office physically in order to run that, that uh, department or, or office. 
Uh, an example they gave was someone who just had a baby, a woman who just gave birth, but working at home and taking care of their child at home, but still being able to run the office. So that was an example the Election Commission brought up. So what you're saying to angels after you did much research on this, will this council after 240 days be able to appoint somebody in that position? Well, that depends. If the mayor is acquitted, he's still the mayor. Exactly. But the, in the event, because we all know that, if, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, Mayor Bloss has a court hearing on March 5th. Is February that, 4th. February 4th, I'm sorry. February 4th. So that's, that's real soon here. That's actually next week. But sure. that's not going to convict him. I mean, they're going to just start the process of a court hearing. And we all know things like that take maybe a year or two years. So realistically, could the council appoint somebody to sit, and take, uh, sit in that position, or can the council actually just um, dictate the responsibilities of what that office does within the village? Can the council do the that? The way the statute is now, Senator, we really can't do anything. Um, that's why I'm trying to ask even the court system to rule whether or not the mayor, with that inability to function as a mayor provision, can be used. Because even if we start trial and we go past beyond the March 8th date and his trial is still not over, that still doesn't give authority to the MPC to select someone to send to the legislature until his court, the judicial verdict is rendered, really. And is that coming from the Attorney General's office, or that's just your interpretation? No, just by this? reading that statute. This is the interpretation by the yes. law. So uh, even after the 240 days, the council sh could not even put somebody if in If his place. case is still active. It's and it still has active. Not been, so yes. he, he hasn't, okay. Because so that, the, the, the key word here, Senator, is vacancy. And until the Guam Election Commission declares that there is a vacancy in that seat, we can't ask to name somebody because there's still a person sitting there. Okay. So in the meantime, this council, are they meeting already in Jotnia? No, they just got their, their letters. Uh, they just signed their appointment letters a couple of days ago. Mayor Savaros will conduct the initial meeting. They still have the, the first order is to select a vice chairman, uh, a secretary, and a treasurer. Okay, and the la uh, last question I have for you, um, Angel, is are you, do you remember the time in 2006 when they had a recall of the Talafofo mayor? Are you, do you remember that? Yes, I do. Mayor Polino, I think it was? Yes, I do. And do you remember what transpired to that? And how, how did they go about doing that? Because I didn't find any law or a bill that was introduced to allow them to go through the recall process. Can you well, explain what happened? Well, that was happened? also petition-driven, and it didn't succeed. But it was done through the council, and it was done in the village, and they, they processed the petition, but... Through the Guam Election Commission, yes. And no amount of bill or anything that, like that was needed in order for them to do that. So the same thing can happen in, in the village of Jotnia, correct? Perhaps, yes. The same exact thing that happened in 2006 for Talafofo can happen in Jotnia again and not spend $20,000 for a recall and then another $20,000 for a special election. So going to the Guam, thank you, Angel. So going to the Guam Election Commission, I attended the meeting last night. Can you kind of summar summarize... Mr. Snogestine, exactly what was said at the um, meeting at the Guam Election Commission when the question was brought up on the agenda, it was uh, P&Q, uh -huh. um, dated January 16, 2020, inquiry from, from Senator Therese Trelawhi, status as Jotman Mayor, and also call of emergency session. Can you please tell us what happened at that meeting? Hello? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you. So on, uh, in the meeting, it brought up the uh, Senator Talari's question on whether the commission has any role in interpreting the uh, failure to perform. Or, um, so it was determined that that is outside of the, uh, the commission's jurisdiction to make that call.
In Sorry, say that again, Pavi. Yes, I believe the, what you're talking about, Senator, is uh, uh, Senator Terlahi asked if uh, uh, what is the commission's role in determining whether or not a um, the uh, mayor in the case can perform or fails to perform his role. Uh, they looked into it and it was determined that that it is not within the commission's jurisdiction to actually determine that role. And then there was a comment made that where, where should this question be given to to determine that? Um, I believe they did mention uh, to refer to the attorney general uh, and possibly they can bring some guidance on that as well. And if I'm not mistaken, it's not in their jurisdiction is yes. what the Guam Election Commission came up with through their legal, um, to, <clears throat> through the person handling the legal side of, of the Election Commission. Um, there's nothing in the law at all that talks about vacancies uh, other than what's placed in here to give them the authority that the only time they can actually act upon something like this is if there's a conviction. Is that true? The, what the commission mentioned is the only time they can act in a, for a special election is if a vacancy occurs relative to the cat, uh, what is categorized under the election code. So, yeah. But I have something here that says that in the event there's a conviction, only then can the uh, Guam Election Commission Yes, because it, it will fall under okay. that uh, condition. Okay. Do you have any more questions, Senator Tello? So we can move on to the next. Nope. I, I'm good for now. Thank you for this Thank you. Fir first opportunity, this first round. All right. Um, sen uh, by Acting Speaker, you had your hand up. You have questions, ma'am? Does yes. any of my colleagues have questions so I can? I just, I just wanted to make a um, point of personal privilege. Uh, the previous speaker stated uh, that people are claiming that Jonia is in disarray and all these situations. The issue here is that there's a leadership void in Jonia and the people have asked us to give them the opportunity for a recall. And I said that the community is divided on that recall. Some don't want it, some do. But if we give them the opportunity to choose whether they want a recall, at least we heard the people's voice for the price of $25,000. Now, if $25,000 is such a big number to us, then we should be debating other issues that are going on in our government for frivolous matters and how money is being spent. This is investing in the people. This is, if even if it's gonna cost $50,000, should there be a special election? $50,000 over the, the concerns of the people no, no longer having to be divided? at least we would have addressed the people's concerns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Um, point of personal privilege, Mr. Chair. According to the speaker, the acting speaker, in the letter it says uh, there's threats to public safety and community welfare, and if, if that's not calling the kettle black, you know, it's saying that there isn't any, then, then she needs to read her own writing. Okay, thank there, you. There, there is possibility to precipitate public safety, uh, impacts of public safety and community welfare. But I'm not saying specifically that Jonia is in disarray and crime is rising. And I do want to thank the Guam Police Department Chief of Police for increasing the presence in the village of Jonia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last thing I'd like to say, since there was no point of privilege, but I will say point of pri personal privilege, I finally got to mention, Mr. Chair, that during the public hearing, only one resident showed up for this bill at the public hearing, one resident of Jonia. Point of information, Mr. Chair. Thank We've you. had two town hall meetings listening to the citizens at the villages. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Does any other colleague have any questions for the panel? Senator Peter Terlai. Sir. This is Joe. I'm just a little bit concerned and I just wanted to address this to the, to the chief of police because you mentioned, uh, um, chief, that the total numbers of, of reported crimes in Jordan is about 30, 40, something like that. Uh, within how many months? So uh, within the past 12 months, uh, the number of reported crimes that, that we've entertained in Jordan, uh, the highest 40, 
three, I believe, and uh, anywhere from in the 30s, mid 30s to uh, high 30s. So you divide that 40 divided by the 12 months each month. So how many are how many crimes is being committed or being reported within that one month, for example? So. Uh, so like for December, there was, I believe, 32 or 33 crimes reported to uh, the Guam Police Department. That's just for December. Right. Okay. So the number of, of reported criminal uh, crimes that uh, occurred in Zonia is 30. L let me That's just the up. numbers that was reported. Let me just pull up the spreadsheet again, sir. I'm sorry, for, so for December, you're showing 35 crimes reported. Uh, the oh, November is 36, uh, October is 31, uh, the high is April 43. Uh, so, you know, so the numbers are 28, 38, 31, 43, 33, 24, 22, 25, 31, 36, 35. And that, that's for the past 12 months. There's so many numbers that you uh, referred uh, just kind of make me dizzy right now. But let me just say this. So the numbers that were reported, but how many was confirmed? No, how those, many was cleared? Th those are actual cases reported to the Guam police. So those cases, the reported cases were entertained at yes. 100%. Yes. Okay. You know, we talked about... You know, and the uh, Bureau of Budget, uh, they're not here, and they wrote us a letter that they cannot be here because there's no money. And I, I think the main topic here today is to make sure that since we're going to this recall process, right, you know, we need 20000 up to 40000 for that, uh, for the recall after to occur, right? So we're talking about there's no money involved. And I just wanted to bring up, uh, and I know that Senator Nelson will support me on this because we have the same bill number, 259. And my bill, my bill is actually would solidify the problems that we have in as far as not being there's not being a, 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 a no, no, no mayor in Zonia, but this bill would expedite the appointment of a mayor, of a temporary mayor. And I know that I have to make that amendment because my bill will start out with, uh, you know. Senator, let's focus on Bill 259. And if you want to have an amendment to Bill 259, we can't speak about any other bill but 259. Well, I'm talking about 259, sir. Okay, I just want to make sure that we don't allude to your bill that you introduced. Because I think you have an amendment, then we can speak about it then when you, when you do introduce the amendment. Okay, so it's not a okay. time to me to, uh, for me to bring up 259? No, no, only if it's, if it's in reference to the bill, if you're going to introduce an amendment, then we can talk about it. But until you introduce the amendment... Well, well the thing... The thing that, what I was getting at, my, uh, Senator, Mr. Chair, is that we're talking about the recall. And it's yes. going to cost money. It's going to cost 40000 So if we don't have that, then how can we continue? I, I would ask that, are, are you proffering an amendment? Are you introducing an amendment so we can address that? No, because I'm not it, introducing an amendment. I'm just saying my piece regarding okay. the... the the subject matter on the on the money, okay. Because I really don't care if if there's a RICO or not. And what I'm saying is here is that if there's no money to support the RICO up to the timeline where we can meet the timeline, so why do we talk about something like this on a RICO if there's no money to support that at, uh, up until the end? That's what I'm I'm getting at. Underst uh, understood. Okay, that's that's all that I'm getting at. Okay. So we're going through the process and spending time talking about RICO. And, you know, the, okay. the, the court hearing for, for the mayor is going to happen February 4th. So what I'm saying is that let me just deviate from 259 right now. 
until later on where you will tell me to go ahead and say something about my bill. Okay? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Senator Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there is a representative from the Guam Election Commission on the panel, is that correct? Okay, who, who is, oh, okay, all right. Thank you. I want to ask questions about what the scenario is that we're proposing in, in Bill 259. Okay, as I understand it, if you look at um, Guam Code Annotated Section 1121B, in order for a recall to be successful, a candidate, uh, the, the people who cast votes must represent two-thirds of the, the votes that were cast in favor of the candidate at the general election. So, and you're nodding yes. So if, if Mayor Blas garnered 1,575 votes, which I believe is what he did, um, then you would need, he would need to, or in that election you would need to have 1,050 people vote yes to recall the mayor, correct? So, so that's the threshold that we're looking at right now. Two-thirds of those that voted to put the mayor in office have to now vote in a recall to remove him, correct? Uh, yes, Senator. Okay. In order, so. for, in order for a recall to be successful, uh, in this case, there would have to be about 1,050 votes, yes. Okay. And also, if those votes are the majority votes cast. The majority votes cast, yes. yes. And right now there are about 2,692 voters yes, in Jotnia as yeah. of 2019. Yes, okay, I so that's the first to... threshold that we're talking about. Um, and then the other thing is if, if, a, if then a recall election, if then a, a special election is called to fill a void, after the recall question is asked and answered, and assuming the recall question is yes. Those people now seeking candidacy for the vacant position of mayor of Jotnia have to then fulfill all the requirements of candidacy per the Guam Election Commission, right? Because right now, Guam Election Commission requires you to, among many other things, mm -hmm. Submit a filing fee of $100, submit court clearances, police clearances, <clears throat> obtain a nominating petition with certain number of, of things, file an organizational report, file uh, certain affidavits, and also financial disclosure. So all the things required of a candidate apply even here, right? That is correct. Okay, and then assuming that the election happens, the special election, candidates submit all of that. When the election is conducted, there is also a procedure and policies within the election commission to certify the elections to ensure that people who are eligible to vote, including absentee voters, including in-house voters, um, all of that has to follow procedure. So you're looking at including the arrival of absentee ballots 10 days after the date of the election. You're looking at about 40 days, right? Uh, actually, Senator, to conduct a special election, it will be 60 days, on or about 60 days. On or about. Yes. So given everything that I said, and I, I'm presuming best case scenario, 1,500 people vote of the majority voters vote affirmatively to remove him. That's two-thirds of how much the mayor got the last election. Mm -hmm. Assuming all the, the um, candidates submit their credentials and are certified candidates, the ballots are, are prepared, the election is conducted, absentee ballots go out, are, wait, are received, everything is certified and verified. Do we make the window required, the timeline, to fill that within the vacancy um, guidelines? 
Uh, I'm sorry, Senator. Can you repeat the question one more time? Assuming you do everything, we go through the process. Mm -hmm. What would be the earliest to conduct a, 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 in order to meet the, we have to fill that, you can only conduct it within, what, 10 days mm -hmm. of, a, of the next general election, right? That's okay. your. Okay. Um. My question, I suppose, is uh, yes. can we meet that mark, number one? So, the, uh, depending on when a vacancy has occurred, that's when the commission can uh, call for a special election. And it's from that, from that point when the vacancy happens, the, uh, the election will happen within, on or about, I'm sorry, 60 days from that point. So it, it actually depends on when uh, a vacancy has occurred. Point of information, uh, Mr. Chair, it must be March 8, 2020 for that vacancy to be declared. That, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. that is correct, Senator. If a vacancy occurs after March 8, it will be outside of the commission's jurisdiction. So 60 days for it to be conducted, today's date minus March 8, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, have we run out of time? If we were to fulfill all the requirements of the Guam Election Commission, have we run out of time, even if we wanted to do everything and everything fell into place 100%? Um, so, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Senator. Your question is, is there enough time to conduct a recall and a special within the... And certify the winner of, say, a special election, assuming that happens. So, in the, um, so to conduct a recall, the statute is actually signed on how to do so. So, should a recall be called, we will conduct it in the same manner of that of a special election. And that will be six, on or about 60 days from the time the recall is called. And then, and, but the recall only asks the question, are you voting to recall him and remove him from office? That's the recall question. That is correct, Senator. And then the special election subsequent to that is who do you choose to fill that vacancy? That so that's another process. That is correct, Senator. Okay. That, and there is, that, my question is, is there enough point of information, I, Mr. Chair? Yes, yes, yes Madam Speaker, please, because at the public hearing, it was yes. discussed exactly the time period. So Maybe we just didn't um, repeat that. Which is also part of the purpose for us asking, for myself asking our colleagues to act quickly on this because uh, the public hearing, there's a, it's a, it's a two-fold process, right? So should this bill pass, that is when the election commission will act, and it is signed, if signed into law, the election commission will act, and it takes 30 days for them to prep for a recall and certify. After that 30 days, if, they, if the recall is warranted, and that position is vacant, it must meet the timeline of March 8, 2020, which is why we're trying to move this expeditiously because it's the time-sensitive legislation. Then after the recall is completed and is certified by March 8, 2020, a vacancy, if a vacancy is declared, it will take 60 days, on or about 60 days, to initiate the special election. So with a little bit backwards planning, this bill, um, if it would even pass, would need to be uh, moved and approved by no later than, I believe, January 24, 2020. Right, okay. Did, did all my colleagues understand what was said? What, I think one of the beauties of public hearings is that when you attend, you hear all of it, and we're just asking the same question. So, and I understand where Senator Torres come from. Senator Kelly, you have questions? Are, 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 were you done already? I'm sorry. Were, were, Senator Torres, were you done, ma'am? Hold, hold on, Senator. Uh, for now, yes. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to do the math in, <laughs> in my mind. Thank you. Yes, no, I understand where you come from. I think uh, what we need to do is... When we go to recess, we'll pull up what's in the committee report, the exact 
statement that the executive director stated during the public hearing, the exact days, and what is the timeline that is needed to make sure that we don't miss the window? Because right. I think that's the biggest question. Are we out of time or not? Right. Senator Kelly, you have a question? So just Masi, Mr. Chair. So we're obviously all here because we're concerned about doing what we can, and we need to understand the landscape as thoroughly as possible. Some of what had been discussed was about the petition process. There is a petition process that's around. There is a petition that has been initiated. So I'd like to ask the uh, Guam Election Commission, has there been a successful petition process of this sort in the past? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Senator. Um, I believe uh, Senator uh, mentioned earlier that it was the recall of the mayoral in Talafofo. That, that recall was initiated through a petition process. And they did meet the required number of signatures needed and the commission went ahead and conducted the election. Malik, and uh, how many petitions have been filed in cases like this? You mentioned Talafofo. Are there other cases that you're aware of? The only one I'm aware of is the Talafofo mayor. And how long ago was that? Uh, I believe that was in 2006, if I can recall. So when you're my age, that's relatively re <laughs> recently. Uh, 2006, but really that's uh, not so long ago. Has the GEC board ever discussed the petition process uh, that it's flawed or unacceptable? Relative to the mayoral recall? Uh, is that specifically just, just to the, the mayoral no. or, or even just in general? No. Or uh, they didn't see no issue with the petition process. Um, to your knowledge, has uh, GEC compared the way that Guam handles declaring vac vacancies and the process of vacancies itself to other like areas in the states? Um, has it been found to be acceptable or comparable compared to other places in the states? Many jurisdictions, they'll have their own rules on what will constitute the vacancy, what actions need to be taken. So I believe Guam is pretty in line with the other jurisdictions. And with the petition process, again, there are um, entities of various sizes, but um, has there been any Comparison, or are you aware of other places in the U.S. that also go through that petition process as a means of determining the will of the people? Um, yes, there in throughout the states there is a uh, throughout the other jurisdiction in the United States there are very similar processes, uh, but again, each state, each municipality varies. Uh, amongst each other. Do you know specifically if the, some of those occur in small municipalities? I'm not familiar with uh, any of the smaller ones, yeah. Okay, so uh, these questions help us understand part of what's available, and I think that's important along with all the other areas that are being explored. Uh, we are looking to see if there's something to fix, if there's something that's flawed, uh, so I think looking at this as comprehensively as possible is important. Is there any reporting to you of petitions once they have been um, initiated? So we had heard that a, a petition has been initiated in Jotnia and that there are 200, perhaps uh, somewhere around 300 signatures. Is there any reporting or communication? Uh, at this moment, we have not received any petitions to recall the uh, Georgia mayor. So for this first round, that's all. So just Masi, Mr. Chair. 
we'll come back to you. Senator Therese, did you have a question you want to ask? That, can you restate, you received no petitions at this point? Uh, that is correct, Senator. At this moment, we're, no petition has been submitted for recall of the John Yomir. But we, I believe they are being circulated. Okay, because the director had said at the public hearing that she would let us inform us when she received the, the amount necessary, oh, um, as if she was receiving some as it went uh, along, but none. Uh, okay, I apologize for that. Uh, but yes, the amount of signatures needed for a recall to be initiated through the petition process is 877. So I'm not too sure if that's what the director was. Have you received any signatures at all? No, no, okay. no all right, petitions. Thank you. Does any of my, Senator Castro, you had your honor, Berger. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question's relative to absentee ballots and so when you're calculating the threshold at 877 or 1050, my assumption is, and I'm, I'm trying to scroll through the committee report as it relates to absentee ballots, how do absentee ballots uh, play a role in the recall election? And is there sufficient time for those to be sent out and to be brought back in, in order to meet the threshold or not? So, yes, uh, Senator, so once, uh, if a recall election is to occur, we will, uh, place it on the website and, and all those who are eligible to vote may apply uh, and we will send them a ballot as soon as it's available. Um, uh, the law does say that the commission will wait 10 days after an election to receive the, uh, any absentee ballot that is still out there that, or that, is still being in, that is still in transit. So we will wait for those ballots. Thank you, Senator Castro. Do any of my colleagues have any other questions? Uh, Senator Lee, and I'll get back to you, Senator Tello. Senator Smasi, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I just also want to reiterate what some of my colleagues had mentioned that this is not, um, it's certainly an unenviable position that we find ourselves in and it's a very irregular and an unfortunate circumstance. Um, but I'm glad that we're here and discussing it and attempting to address it in this way. Um, during the course of the, the questioning, uh, Mr. Sablon, you had mentioned that you requested additional GPD presence for the village of Jotnya. And so I just wanted to ask you why. I did so because at the first town hall meeting in Jonia, uh, Mrs. Mesa came up and was concerned about, you know, they're not seeing the police presence in Jonia and the kids would be out of school for Christmas vacation and she just wanted to be assured that there'll be police around. So I sent a, a request to the chief and he promptly assisted us in that request. Well, I certainly thank you very much um, for making that request. And Chief, thank you for making your officers available uh, to do additional checks in the village of Jonia. We've also received some phone calls in my office, and I'm sure some other um, senators' offices have also received phone calls from Jonia residents who have described um, you know, being fearful, especially in this time and without leadership at the helm. So I appreciate you stepping in, and I know that the Jotnia Mayor's office staff is really, you know, trying to just come yes. together and keep things moving for the, uh, the villagers there, so I appreciate their work as well. Um, but this climate of fear was also communicated to us during the public hearing. And so I just wanted to ask uh, the Chief of Police if he has responded to any inquiries or any cases where people have um, called, there hasn't necessarily been a crime committed, but they maybe felt unsafe in their homes and have asked you to come out. Has that ever occurred, Chief? Senator, so uh, <clears throat> I, I think we know when people are victims of crime or when they see that there's crime within their community, whether it's Joe near Baragata or, you know, any other village for that matter, you know, of course, there, there's an uneasy, uh, unsafe feeling. And so, you know, we, we we make sure that we respond uh, to the needs of the community, uh, not just for Jonia, but you know, taking into account all the other villages as well. As well, 
uh, you know, I, I did give a call to the uh, commander for the Hagatnya precinct, and you know, I asked him to just generally describe to me uh, what's going on in in Jonya, uh, in particular because of the void left by the uh, the lack of the mayor. And I asked him, you know, point blank, is there an uptick in crime? Is there an unusually high number of calls now coming in uh, because of the void in the uh, the absence of the mayor? And uh, there's nothing unusual that, that he noted uh, that he would like to share with me that, uh, other than, like I said, you know, we, we've seen that the, the, the number of crimes uh, in Jonya remain uh, the same, if not, uh, you know, flat. Uh, so there's no unusually high number of crimes that are being reported. Thank you very much, Chief. And again, I just want to thank you for your presence here and being available to answer our questions. There have been a few amendments that have been circulated by some of my colleagues, and so I'll reserve my questioning um, with regard to those amendments to you all um, once they've been introduced. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I'm going to go to Mad Madam Speaker. Okay. I have, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Okay, before you go to the second round. No, no, I'm just, okay. okay well, oh, I see. I haven't even started. I think we're still all in the first round because there's only a few of you asking questions. So I'm going to claim that it's still in the first round. There's Thank only four or five of you asking questions out of the 15 of us, 14 of us. Thank so you. I was going to go to Senator Tello, but I'll, I'll give you... Uh, Yours real quick? So, yeah, just okay. a point of information, uh, Mr. Chair. It's just that um, during the public hearing, it was stated that uh, if we're looking at timeline, recall that the, the director of um, Guam Election Commission <coughs> mentioned that two weeks prior is needed as well to prepare. That means the printing of ballots and stuff like that. So we have to take into account two weeks prior to the March, um, I'm sorry, February, uh, deadline so right but but I, think, I just wanted to make that clear but it's think, two weeks prior okay before. what we're going to need is we're going to need the election commission to comment because i was just asking him on the side here and there's a different number of days now because they have to go back after the hearing so senator madam speaker acting speaker before i because i have senator therese now ready to ask a question you have a question a short yeah. question yes i have a question uh tom thank you for being here can you just Clarify the days, because I believe we're all on a different page um, no, no. from the public hearing we left last night and for the calls that we made through the Guam Election Commission. Right, and I'll ask you, Tom, start with using this hearing we're doing today. That's going to be key to count the days. Thank you. And clarify whether it's 30 calendar days or working days. Thank you. Uh, yes, Senator. So I know at that time the director was actually going to look into the actual timeline for the recall because the statute is actually silent on how to conduct the recall. And because it's silent, we will, we will conduct the recall in, in the same manner uh, as that of a special election. And a special election calls for an election to be conducted on or about 60 days uh, from the time of the vacancy or at this point from the time of uh, a uh, recall is called. So now it's not no longer 30 days. Now today it is 60 days for yes. the recall to be initiated. Yes, that's correct. That is if the bill passes and is signed into law. Yes. That, uh, okay. Oh, oh. So I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Senator. It's when the legislature votes the two thirds. Uh, so it's upon voting. Yes. If the legislature, so it doesn't have to get move. The start date from that is doesn't it doesn't go through the executive branch? Um, it it would I guess for the appropriations portion of the the bill. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mr. S thank you. So just clear that. Say that one more time, Tom. My, my uh, colleagues, yes, sorry, let, let us take a short recess oh. so we can clarify, okay. yeah, and then we can go back to record because. Thank you. Short recess.
We have returned from recess, and Senator Moylan, you have questions, and immediately after you would be Senator Therese Terlai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question for the Election Commission, Mr. San Augustine. Um, okay, just looking at the bill again, to be clear, that what we are asking in this bill, 259, is uh, appropriated funds twice, $22,850, of unappropriate general fund balance for the, from the end of physical year 2019 for the recall and then for this special election. So that would total from the unappropriate general fund end of physical year 2019, that would total $45,700. Does the Guam Election Commission have funds available to do this without funds being appropriated as from the general fund balance at the end of fiscal year 2019. Do you currently have funds available that you can use if this bill is passed into law? Um, no, Senator. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, then I, I just need to grasp this a little bit more here that, you know, reading again from our Office of the Governor, uh, this memo, uh, that basically is strong arming uh, this body because they are definite and they are saying for sure that any bills that seek to appropriate from the FY 2019 funds, it, there's no money available. And I'm looking at that and basically what I'm getting from this, and especially since the Office of the Governor is not represented here but only with this memo, they're basically telling the 35th Guam legislature to go fly a kite if you think we're going to get money as, as appropriated in this, in this bill, 259. And I think they, the office of the governor has proven so, uh, as we have in our budget, that they haven't even uh, paid Guam Memorial Hospital $10 million that we put in our budget. So I'm really concerned of the office of the governor uh, attitude here on our, our situation where we're at. So, but I thank you for my question, I, and I do appreciate the answer. I, I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Senator Moylan. I was just gonna reiterate that when we were doing the budget and we approved the 10 million from the unappropriate money from 2019, she signed off on that. They also admitted at the budget and committed the whole that they're anticipating $27 million, and that's where the $10 million came from. They're now reporting 22. Okay, so until the audit happens, Senator Moynihan, then we're gonna know, we are all gonna know exactly how much money's left, because we do wanna take care of Jim H. Okay, Senator Therese. Thank you, Madam, I mean, Mr. Chairperson, thank you so much. And I wanna thank the panel who are here, um, OFB, uh, the Mayor's Council, and Chief of Police, I, I thank you for taking your time to be here and clarify the issues of uh, crime and safety in the village of Jonia. And I realize that all villages are facing crime and, uh, and that is an issue we are continuing. We all have to continue to work together. So Sizu Asmasi. And thank you again to the three members of the Guam Election Commission staff who are here. You are doing a good job. And I, it's, uh, I just wanna thank you for this. And I know it's not always easy to appear before the legislature and, and answer questions right off the bat, so thanks. So um, if I could just start off with, so the bill, the bill does a couple things. One, the bill calls for a recall election. It, it says the legislature is going to approve a recall election. That means it's going to send it out to the villagers of Jotnia to vote whether or not to recall. It's not a vote that we are recalling, it's a vote to send it out to Jotnia and let the people of Jotnia vote whether to recall or not. And the bill as substituted does another thing. It also says that uh, this was not on the bill at the public hearing, but it also adds on a special election to fill any vacancy that might arise during that recall election. And that's why the, the amount the cost of this bill has risen from 22,000 to 45,000 now. And uh, 
I guess I just want to, again, state for the record that without BBMR here to talk to us about the fiscal impacts of this bill, I just I can't help but feel like what kind of legislature are we if we can't get the, the executive branch to come down and, and answer fiscal questions? And I, I just, it seems to me we should not, we should not stand for that because you might think 50, 45,000 is not a big deal in this case, but it, we're talking about the source of the funds. And it's, it's contentious, it's very unclear, and again, we're going to be acting uh, in the dark, so to speak, on, on whether that source of funding exists or not, or whether it's prudent to use it, or whether there's money someplace else that we can use, Mr. Chair. There's also another section of the bill that, uh, section three of the bill restates the, the existing Guam code of which events cause a vacancy in the office of the mayor. And so what this bill will do by section three is to add another item which says that there will be a vacancy in the office of the mayor if there's a recall. Okay, so it's not, it's a, uh, it doesn't do anything about the other, the, the list of several items of what determines a vacancy in the office of mayor. So apparently, there is, well, that's my next point. There is no determination by anyone at this point that there is a permanent vacancy in accordance with this, the law that we have on the books. That, so they're making, uh, in the reverse, a determination, I would think, somebody's making a determination that, that there is no resignation from office, there is no refusal or failure to assume office, that, um, you know, all these things, that there is no change of residence from the municipality in which he was elected, that, uh, there is no incapacitation because of illness and unable to continue for the remainder. You know, so none of these has been declared to exist so far. But my question, and I feel like we've been, um, it's, it's been very complex, I feel like, because we, we don't know who's made that determination, right? They're looking at us now, I think, kind of, to make that determination, but really, who's supposed to make that determination? So first, the mayor's council, and I think appropriately, asked the attorney general, is there a vacancy? And they did that. They asked him straight out, is there a vacancy? And they got a memo back that says, according to this list, it is unclear whether detention in a criminal case constitutes a vacancy according to this statute. That's what the uh, Attorney General... Senator Therese, is, is that the memo from the Attorney General's yes. office? Yes, so the, mem the Attorney General okay. wrote a memo to the, the Executive Director of the Mayor's Council of Guam dated October 4, 2019, and it's, it's written by Assistant Attorney General Andrew Kenga, and he, they, the Mayor's Council had asked two questions. One, does the Mayor's Council have the authority to appoint a Municipal Planning Council in the absence of Mayor from office? Two, does the current pre-trial detention of the mayor cause a vacancy in his office requiring a special election? So the attorney general went down the list of um, section 13106 with the list of cause, you know, what causes a vacancy. That would trigger a special election. And so the, the Attorney General said on page four, as stated above, the mayor is being detained on federal criminal charges. Detention is not expressly identified as an event constituting a vacancy under 13106. One could argue that the mayor's detention is a vacancy under 13106 by implication. It is possible that the Guam Election Commission could determine whether a specific set of circumstances would require a special election. I underline that, Mr. Chair. They are, and then they go on. It is also possible that the question could be determined by legal action with the court. 
It is clear, however, that this office, the Attorney General's office, does not have the authority to declare that a vacancy exists. I found that very surprising, Mr. Chair, that if the Attorney General could not declare an, a vacancy, then who does? And so I guess I'm concluding that it is the Guam Election Commission and the Attorney General has hinted that it is the Guam Election Commission. It is possible that the Guam Election Commission could determine whether a spef specific set of circumstances would require special election. So I, I want to just ask the Guam Election Commission, has the Guam Election Commission ever considered specifically whether there is a vacancy in the office of mayor in Jotnia pursuant to 13106? Uh, no, Senator, I don't believe they considered it specifically. All right. And um, I guess I, wanted, I want to ask, is it possible that the Guam, but the Guam Election Commission has declared vacancies in, in our history, hasn't it? I believe what they did was more so inform that there was a vacancy and if the statute required uh, called for the election of that okay, because but, of the vacancy. Because, yeah, but you have to acknowledge there's a vacancy. The election commission would have to be the one to acknowledge there's a vacancy. They would have to be the one to say yes, somebody it died, somebody was declared mental incompetent by a final judgment. They would have to, someone has to acknowledge this. And so it looks to me like that is the Guam Election Commission. I do believe that that is what has happened. It is the Guam Election Commission that has declared, I think we've had deaths prior to taking office and they are the ones who declared there was a death, there is a, vac there is a vacancy, we must have a special election. And you said earlier that the Guam Election Commission declares the special election? Um, in the case of the, for the mayor, I'm sorry, uh, if there was a vacancy, it would uh, call for a special election. Okay, thanks. So that's um, there's another, so it, it's either a question or it's, um, it's, we're sure that according to 13106, the Guam Election Commission declares that whether that condition has been met. They declare there's a vacancy. Attorney General is washing his hands saying he's not going to declare that, that, it ha you know, that that's not what they're going to do. I, um, there's another section of the code, section 40110B, 5GCA 40110B, and this is uh, where they uh, talk about the mayors and their duties. And so this provision also discusses a vacancy that occurs in the office of mayor with less than 240 days before the next mayoral election. This is the question that I sent to the Guam Election Commission because the language of that section says very specifically, Sorry, wait, I have it right here. It says, vacancies is the title of this section, and on subsection B, it's titled mayors, and it says, if by reason of death, resignation, removal from office, inability or failure to perform, there shall be a vacancy, then this shall happen. And this does not, again, it's not very clear who's supposed to say that these conditions occur. It doesn't, and it doesn't refer us back to 13106 saying if, you know, if, if the conditions of 13106 occur, it doesn't say that, and it says if these conditions occur, death, resignation, removal, inability or failure to perform. So that's what I had asked because that seems to be the implication and that was the debate, right, whether he can perform. So I asked the Guam Election Commission to make a de determination as to whether the mayor was, had 
inability or failure to perform. And uh, I guess if I could just ask you to repeat what, what I asked if they, during the break if they had anything in writing. They said there's something pending that will be sent to us, a formal answer. But if you could just state uh, what the answer from the Election Commission was as to whether he, he is unable or fails to perform his duties. Uh, yes, Senator. So in uh, last night's meeting, the commission specifically addressed it that your, your question regarding the failure or I'm sorry, the inability or failure to perform. And it was to determine in that meeting that uh, that determination will fall outside of the jurisdiction of the election commission. So it wouldn't be them. To Did the election that. commission determine whose jurisdiction does that fall under? No, I believe they mentioned they could ask the attorney general. So. All right, so we've also, I mean, the mayor's council also asked the attorney general. And they didn't really answer that specific question. Mm -hmm. they, they, they said, we are informed by the mayor's council that the mayor did not, no, they said, um, there are more than 240 days until the next mayoral election. Therefore, 5GCA 4011B is not currently applicable. So they didn't really analyze who makes that determination, whether they would mm -hmm. or you would, but I'm, it seemed very clear to me that one of the two of you has to do that. And it seems consistent with the 13106 determination that the Guam Election Count, uh, Commission makes, mm -hmm. that they should also be the one to make this determination. I don't know. But if you go on in 4011, 40110, it tells you what to do if that vacancy occurs. So our statutes are very clear as to what happens when we do have a permanent vacancy. Our issue is we don't have one, that, or, or we have no one determining whether we have one. That's the issue. So what we um, so we can't get a clear determination as to whether we have a permanent vacancy, but I think, Mr. Chair, we can all agree we have what looks like a temporary vacancy, at the very least, right? So at least we might have a temporary vacancy, unless we have. And I know that the vice speaker, or the speaker, has asked the attorney general also, can the mayor perform his duties? in prison because um, if he can then maybe we don't even have a temporary vacancy I mean it I hate to say this but it, it's almost like we're going in circles on this you know is who's the authority to tell us these things so if there's a temporary vacancy um, it, it it looks like that too I think us the lay people of course you know but, but he has been able to appoint a municipal planning council. So he's, he's doing some of his duties currently. I guess that's how we could describe it. I don't know. I'm waiting for the attorney general's opinion on that, right? Whether he can do this, cannot do that. That would really, I think, uh, set a path for us, Mr. Mr. Chair. But, um, but if, I think, from the two meetings that were had in Jotnia, and those meetings were, you know, the topic was to discuss, you know, crime in the village. That was the issue that they wanted to talk about, whether we had a mayor or not, what were we gonna do about it, and uh, uh, some discussion on crime was, dis was discussed, but I think the majority had to do with what are we gonna do, with, you know, without a mayor, with, and what was the, uh, mayor's council doing, what was the police department doing, things like this. And at the time, I mean, at one of those hearings that I was at, Mr. Chair, I just want to note that, you know, I did tell the people of Jotnia that there are three bills to address the mayor's vacancy or if there's a vacancy, things like this, the, the absence of a municipal planning council, and that they would have the opportunity to speak on those bills, to testify on those bills, that we would make sure that they know that everyone who had signed up was going to be notified that you know when we were going to have the public hearings. And um, 
I feel you know, a little bit remiss that we, we've had a hearing on one bill and we are here, but we haven't really talked about the others. And I, I feel like the others are also very um, good suggestions as to what to do, especially in the long run in situations like this that have, were not anticipated, obviously. And I want to note one more thing is that one of the conditions of a permanent vacancy is very clearly a conviction a conviction of a felony. And so I am sure that they must have contemplated other cases, whether we can declare it a vacancy in an arrest, in a, you know, um, accusation, allegations, I don't know what, but, and I, so I, I was wondering, why aren't, why don't they include that? Why don't, why didn't they include that in this list of reasons that cause a permanent vacancy if you are arrested for a crime, especially something horrendous, right? Why not? And I, I don't know, I found that, um, you know, even Congress, it says according to the Constitution, they have criteria for office and that's, you know, for, so for constitutional offices, they don't allow you to discriminate based on arrest. And uh, this is not a constitutional office. This is one created by the legislature. So arguably, we can put that in there if we wanted to. They never did for decades. I, I, I know I'm going long, Mr. Speaker, but I'm almost, I'm almost done. And um, so if, we, um, if there's a permanent vacancy before March 8, the laws very clear. If there's a vacancy determined by anyone, the law is clear, there's going to be a special election. Election commissions gearing up, they're ready to do that. If there is a permanent vacancy after March 8, the law is also very clear. For example, if he goes to trial and is found guilty, it, the law is clear. There is going to, of how in any village this would transpire, it would be that the Municipal Planning Council is going to appoint uh, to fill the remainder of the term with the consent of the legislature, it says. That's what this statute says, and I believe this is a relatively older statute. What it doesn't provide for us in law is what do we do if there's a temporary vacancy, or you know, if there's a vacancy between now and the trial, or if there was a vacancy for the last 40 days, 30 days, um, if somebody had a heart attack and had to get bypass surgery and goes for two months, it doesn't give us what to do in those cases. It, it's almost implying that they're able to do their job no matter what, you know, that there, there was no need for a temporary vacancy. But I, I guess I'm not very comfortable with that. I feel like there are situations where we should address temporary vacancies, Mr. S Mr. Chair. And then finally, I want to bring up the mechanics of this bill that we are we're addressing with the help of the Guam Election Commission. The bill calls for a recall election upon passage of the bill. So assuming the governor signs and approves the, the appropriations contained in this bill for a recall election, uh, the Guam Election Commission will need 60 days to conduct that election. I guess there's been a slight shift, and maybe you can explain. When the director here was here testifying on the bill, I believe she mentioned 30 days, but she was going to check with her counsel, and they've now confirmed, and maybe you can confirm for the record, that, that it's 60 days now, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Senator. So at the time of the hearing, uh, the director did mention the 30 days, but she will confirm with counsel because... Uh, the question was how to conduct the recall election, and we mentioned that the statute, it, the code is silent on that. So since it is silent, we will conduct the, ele the recall election in the same manner of that of the special election, okay. which is a 60 days. 60 days. So, so if we get this bill to the governor signed back to the election commission by February 5th, that was one of the dates we were using, 60 days would be you know, March, April, beginning of April, April 5th, first week. Uh, that's, that's the recall election deadline. You get 10 days to count your votes and certify, wait for the absentee ballots. That's um, April 15, perhaps, or a little later, April 15. And then we need to have a special election, right? 
And if we're going to have a special election, that's going to take another 60 days. So we're already, I said April 15, that would be May 15, June 15, June 15, by the time we determine who's going to fill that seat that we've recalled, right? Yes, the, uh, approximately uh, around that time. Yes. Yeah. Um, I also found out during the break that the nominating petitions for the actual election, the, new, the next election, to, for you know, the election coming up this summer, mm -hmm. is June 30. Yes, that is the deadline. So, so what did we say? What, where did we get up to for the special election? June 15? Uh, June 15. Yes, it will be around that time. June 15, June. we will know the results of a special election. They will fill that seat from June until December. We will know in November who's going to be put into office in January. So the people who are running for mayor, and we found out at these meetings that there are approximately seven people, I'm counting, and if the current mayor is found not guilty and runs again, you know, maybe more. So we don't even know yet how many people are running, but they are going to be... Um, circulating. Circulating their nominating petitions at the same time as those who are circulating for um, the, the, the permanent par yeah, yes, the spot, permanent. I think. Yeah. Now I'm not an expert, but I'm <laughs> so grateful. If you want to add anything to uh, what I'm saying here, please, please do. Yes, they. If that was the case, uh, uh, they would be circulating their petitions around the same time. Yeah. All right. So. I guess, Mr. Mr. Chair, all of this news is new to me. I'm still, you know, I was, I was working so hard when I heard we were going to have a, an emergency session to try to get my head around all of it, to incorporate what we heard at the hearing, plus what we have not heard on those other bills or other, you know, uh, remedies or, or, of course, things shift so fast. Uh, then there was a municipal planning council appointed in the interim after the hearing, I think. That type of thing, and, and we still are waiting for answers from the Attorney General, so I just feel like I'm, I'm going to um, use my time now to absorb this information from the Guam Election Commission as to the timing. I think it, it really uh, throws off what we were intending, or we might have been intending to do by uh, a bill today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Therese. Does any of the, my colleagues like to pose any question on the panel, and if not, I will release them. We'll have a quick recess, we'll release the panel, and then we'll come back and we'll entertain any amendments or further discussion on Bill 259. No other question, we'll be on recess.
The Committee of the Whole has returned from recess. We have three amendments, if not more, but three for sure. Amendments on the floor. And the first one we will entertain is the amendment from Senator P Jose Piro Terlai. Sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I, I uh, say my amendment, I just want to say thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for reinforcing consolation on my part. Uh, and I want to just thank you for wholeheartedly for that. First of all, uh, I proffer an amendment to, uh, to Bill 259-35 to add Section 5, Section 13106, Chapter 13, Title 3, Guam Code Annotated, to read. 13106, Temporary Vacancy. If the mayor is unable to perform his or her duties as prescribed by in 5 GCA, Section 40112 of Division 4 of Chapter 40, due to any circumstance that described, circumstance not described in Section in 3 GCA, Section 13106, Chapter 13, the Municipal Planning Council of the affected village shall appoint, shall appoint an acting mayor with the advice and consent of the within 30 days of the temporary vacancy being identified. This acting mayor should serve until the duly elected mayor can return to his or her office duties or a new mayor is duly elected by the people of Guam in a general election. Thank you, uh, Senator Terlai. But I think uh, we would need you to state that your intent of your amendment is to delete in Bill 259. I think that's that's how you have your amendment submitted. So if you can state that for the record, how your amendments would lead to, how the amendment would be proffered on Bill 259 that would lead to your amendment. You already read your amendment part, but the beginning part you need to read out. Let, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am deleting the, uh, the initial bill, 259-35, to read, to, to, uh, to take out all this section here on this page, second page, to delete. And third page. Also, third, third page, to delete. In this entirety. Okay, we we'll take a recess. Let's let's take a very short recess so we can go over that, Senator. Thank you.
The Committee of the Whole is back from recess. I'd ask uh, Senator Jose Pito Terlai to please uh, restate your amendment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to restate, I want to mention that I want to restate the amendment uh, uh, to, del to delete section one through section four of the bill and replace it with the following. Section one, section 131.06A of chapter 13, title three, Guam code annotated to read. 13106A temporary vacancy. If the mayor is unable to perform his or her duties as prescribed in 5 GCA section 4112 of Division 4, Chapter 40, due to any circumstance or circumstances not described in 3 GCA section 13106. Chapter 13, the Municipal Planning Council of the affected village shall appoint an acting mayor with the advice and consent of the legislature in Guam within 30 days of the temporary vacancy being identified. This acting mayor should serve until the duly elected mayor can return to his or her official duties or a new mayor is duly elected by the people of Guam in a general election. I also want to state uh, that uh, to allow the Legislative Council to make changes on the, t uh, on the title. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, uh, do you want to also include the effective date? Yes, and to include the effective date that of, is, this, of this bill. Okay. That the act shall be effective upon enactment. Am I correct? All right. Sen uh, Madam Speaker. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make an amendment to that amendment. Um, it, on page three, where it reads subsection 13106. This is the area that is crossed out. I'd like to keep this section and put events causing permanent, include the word permanent vacancy in the municipal offices of mayor and vice mayor and to keep the entire section so the statute still remains whole. Only because if, he, if this is a, 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 an effort to a solution to address the issues today in this temporary vacancy amendment, I'd like it to be clear in this section 13106 subsection that we keep the entire statute and to include the word permanent where it says events causing permanent vacancy in the municipal offices. No, he already did the effective date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ma Madam Speaker, do we have a copy? Does everybody have a copy of that, your proposed amendment? It's, it's just right on the third page, Mr. Chair. He, oh, he okay. lined it out, so I just wanted to make an amendment to keep that Oh, that section. Yes, sir. All right. Do, you, do we have uh, any any senator would like to speak on the amendment to the amendment on uh, Senator Nelson's uh, Senator yes. Therese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, I support the amendment to add the word permanent and to leave uh, permanent before vacancy. So this. To clarify that section 13106 of our existing law describes a permanent vacancy and what events cause a permanent vacancy in the office of mayor. And uh, keeping this list in the bill, Mr. Chair, is uh, I think a good idea because it actually adds J. It's not underlined. It, it should have been underlined but in the bill, in the original bill, but J is new. So that's the new part that we want to include in the existing 13106 also is, is to include J, which says if there's a recall, of course there's a permanent vacancy, right? right? That's it. And so I support the amendment, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Lee? 
Sidos Masi, Mr. Chair, I also rise in support of this uh, amendment to the amendment. And I just um, have a, would like to pose a question um, to the author of the original amendment, um, if he would yield. Uh, the very first piece of this amendment is to strike sections one through four. And so I just wanted to clarify if section four should, should be removed, and that's the effective date, or if we can keep that in. Um, I asked that question, so it's actually just to keep it in place, to have so, that, that effective date. But it won't read as section four. It'll probably read as section two. It'll be renumbered. Right, it'll be renumbered. Thank you. That's what I asked. And he, and he answered it then. Does any other agree, of my colleagues, senators, would like to on the amendment to the amendment? There being none, the amendment passes as written. Now back to the main amendment. The end of my colleagues, Senator Therese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I support the amendment. Um, there are several amendments made in this bill. One is to delete certain sections, so I support that. Um, and I, I support the addition of language that is being proposed regarding a temporary vacancy. And if I may address that section, Mr. Chair, I, I've passed yes. out an amendment to that section, which is the temporary vacancy. Uh, I think. <clears throat> Does all my colleagues have a copy of it? Let's see. I, yeah, I think ignore that part on the top that says Section 5. Yeah, it, yeah, just, it, yes, yeah, you right. can see. It's just to make an amendment yeah. to, the, uh, to the original amendment. Right. The temporary vacancy language, right. which was added by the other yes. Senator Terlahi. Right. Yes. Okay, does everybody have a copy? Could I have a copy here? Okay, Senator Therese, please Thanks. proceed. Thank you. Um, if I could add one word to this uh, verbally that's not written, Mr. Chair, and that's to add the word temporarily after the word is. So if the mayor is temporarily, I would like to add that right now. And then you can see what I also am adding by the double underline. So. The provision as proposed is, is if the mayor is temporarily unable, and I'm putting in the language that says who's going to determine that, so as determined by the Municipal Planning Council of the affected village, and then it says to perform his or her duties prescribed in the law for more, and I'm putting in now a time period for more than 30 consecutive days, and I'm open to change on that, but I'm putting that in for now, for more than 30 consecutive days, Due to the circumstances, uh, due to any circumstance not in our existing law that would result in a permanent vacancy. So, if for any other reason that doesn't fit in the permanent vacancy criteria, for any other reason a mayor might be temporarily unable to perform his duties, that we are, this, this new provision will now say it's a temporary vacancy. So, um, and then it, it says that the, the Municipal Planning Council of the affected village shall appoint an acting mayor. Now this is uh, the, the, the preceding speaker's amendment. I'm adding the words. I'm taking out that they have to do this appointment within 30 days of temporary vacancy. I'm just taking that out because I think putting that kind of timeline is very hard to enforce. And they do it when the MPC can do it. <laughs> I think it's going to be what we have to live with, unfortunately. But uh, so I'm, I'm also saying because the original law says, um, with the advice and consent of the legislature, I'm saying so upon confirmation, which I'm, I mean by that the advice and consent of the legislature. So upon confirmation, that's all I'm adding here. He shall serve until... Uh, he can return to his duties. And I'm, then I'm adding again another time when it ends. It also ends, this temporary vacancy will also end when the position is declared permanently vacant. 
And you can see the others are just typos. I mean, yeah. And that will, of course, result in a special election, which is why I changed the election provision at the very end. To do a Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Trish. Does any of my colleagues would like to speak on that amendment? Are there any objections to the amendment? There being none, amendment passes. Are there, are there any colleagues who would like to speak on the main amendment? We're going back. Yes. Okay. Senator. S Senator Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I apologize. Before you <laughs> gaveled down, and since this um, amendment is already accepted, I just have a, I don't know if I can go back. I just have two questions to strengthen and possibly clarify the language that we just adopted. So I just want to confirm with the author of this amendment that it's more than 30 consecutive calendar days. And then on the sixth line, upon legislative confirmation, because it just says upon confirmation. So. I just wanted to see if I can request that of the, the author of this amendment. If you, if you can, like, we can take a quick reset. Oh, she has no objection to okay, it. Okay, so just adding 30 consecutive calendar days due Correct. to any circumstance not described in 3GCA, and that's on line three. And then on line six, upon legislative confirmation, this acting mayor shall serve until the duly elected mayor can return to his or her official duties. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sen Senator Dries? Uh, notwithstanding the rules, I'd like to speak one more time on, on the overall amendment and on this section, Mr. Okay. Chair, with, after consultation with legal. I'd like to add um, on the line where it says, due to any circumstance not described in 3GCA 13106, there's another criteria we have to add here, and that is or 5GCA 40110B. And, and 4011B is a, another part of the code where it describes a vacancy. A permit. 40110. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Bravo. B is in boy, so uh, add in or section four, no, or five GCA section four zero one one zero of title five comma Guam code annotated. B is in boy. I, I would ask that. <laughs> If, if, if we take a quick recess and just rewrite it so that everybody can see it, because the bee and the boy and the, just so we can get clarity. Okay, just a quick recess, just, we'll just fix it up. Thank you.
committee of the whole is back from recess. I'd like to get clarification from Senator Lee. You had an amendment to the main amendment. You're adding... Um, yes, that's right, Mr. Chair. I believe that the um, revised amendment that's been circulated to my colleagues, it, it has a Senator Pito Terlahi as the proposer of this amendment. It, it, is, it includes the two previous amendments. Um, so again, on line three, more than 30 consecutive calendar days. So the inclusion of the word calendar is there. And That's then correct. on the sixth or seventh line, upon it, previously it said upon confirmation, but we've added the word legislative. So upon legislative confirmation, and that also exists in this new um, amended <coughs> version, or this new um, version of the Terlahi Amendment. All right. Uh, are there any, any of my colleagues would like to speak on that, or are there any objection? No objection. Amendment passes. Thank now, you. Um, back to, to Senator Therese, you had an amendment because of the missing codes. Yes, yes. ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and the clerks have incorporated my, my suggestion, which is to add the words 5 GCA 40110B. And so that's in the written before you, and that's, so that's one. Are there any questions or any objection, my colleagues? There being none, amended as read. Yes, Senator Trees? I'd like to add one more amendment, Mr. Chair, to this, and that is in the very beginning of the section to add the words, in the absence of a vice mayor. Comma. We're describing uh, what to do in a temporary absence of a mayor, but if there's a vice mayor, then we shouldn't have to say anything, right? So I'm saying in the absence of a vice mayor, comma, if the mayor t is temporary, the rest is, if the mayor is temporarily unable, blah, blah, blah. So it's gonna read in the absence of a vice mayor, comma, comma, And if the mayor is temporarily un unable? Correct. Okay, I'm, I'm, I was just visualizing maybe slash mayor or slash vice mayor. So if either one is gone, you, you fix it. No. No, it'll be separate? I feel like we only need to fix this if there's an absence of a mayor. Of if the there's mayor. an absence of a vice mayor, I don't think we need to do anything. We've got the mayor in place to right. act. If there's okay. an absence of, a, if, if there's no vice mayor, we need to act. We need to All provide right. something. Okay, so your amendment would say on that first line, if... In the absence of a vice mayor, comma. Any objection by my colleagues? None? Amendment passes. We will now proceed to... If I'm correct, I think it's Senator Amanda Shelton. Oh, Sen Sen I'm correction. Senator. Okay, now let's let's. Point of We're going to go back to the main amendment yeah, and yes. vote on it. Then That's we can right. move to any other amendments. Okay. Are there any objection to the main amendment? You have an objection, Madam Spe Speaker? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you're just raising the objection. Okay, then we'll move to vote on the amendment. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. Motion passes. Motion passes. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, yes, that, that vote was for uh, the pedo amendment. Uh, Pedus amendment. Okay, and, thank you. Ca and captures everybody's amendment to okay. that amendment. Okay, just one Now to we sure. will proceed to. Madam Speaker, you have an amendment to the bill? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have an amendment. I believe it's passed out. It's uh, to add new sections 456 to the bill to read, so I'm not sure if the amendments might have changed those sections that we made. So perhaps legal can just uh, 
sorry, legal, but if you could just fix that as, a, as, a, as an administrative fix. Section 4, subsection 40110 of Article 1, Chapter 40 of Division 4 of Title 5, Guam Code Annotated. And annotated is amended to read 40110 vacancies. So we keep within statute Section A and B, which vice mayor is a vacancy in the office of the vice mayor less than 240 days before the date of the next general election. For mayors and vice mayors shall be filled for the unexpired term by a majority vote of the Municipal Planning Council of the municipality in which the vacancy occurs subject to the advice and consent of Iles Latora. Section B, mayors, if by reason of death, resignation, removal from office, inability or failure to perform, there shall be a vacancy in the office of the mayor less than 240 days before the date of the next general election for mayors and vice mayors. Part one, it shall be filled by the vice mayor in a municipality where there is a vice mayor and there shall be a vacancy in the position of vice mayor until the end of the term or is what we are including uh, in part two, we are cross crossing out in a municipality where we are including the word if there is no vice mayor and, if the, vac and the vacancy is less than 240 days before the date of the next general election for mayors and vice mayors, the vacancy of the remaining term shall be filled by a majority vote of the Municipal Planning Council of the municipality in which the vacancy occurs subject to the advice and consent of Iles Latora, or if the Municipal Planning Council is not established within the municipality, the Executive Director of the Mayor's Council of Guam shall be appointed as the acting member of said municipality for up to 90 calendar days. The acting mayor shall nominate members to establish the MPC of said municipal municipality who shall be approved by two-thirds vote of the mayor council, Mayor's Council of Guam. It goes then down to read um, section 5, subsection 40124 is amended to read. Um, there, there is established a municipal planning council within each of the districts of the territory of Guam. The mayor, upon taking office, shall select and appoint a municipal planning council MPC within 90 calendar days after taking office. And this is kind of the crux of the issue because we haven't had an MPC for three years in the village of Jonia, so now we are making it a requirement. Uh, if an MPC is not established by the mayor of said municipality, pursuant to subsection A of the section, the mayor shall submit a memorandum to the mayor's council of Guam and the e list Latour and Guahan providing the reason for his or her failure to comply with the subsection of this section. The legislative may, in its discretion, provide an additional 30, day, 30 calendar days to comply with subsection A of this section. And if the MPC is not established within 125 days of the mayor taking office, the executive director of the MCOG shall appoint the members of the MPC who shall be approved by two thirds vote of the MCOG. The executive director shall transmit the approved members of the MPC to Iles Latora and Imagahog and Guahan. In section six, subsection 40127, municipal planning, council vacancy, planning council vacancy. In case of a vacancy of the municipal planning council by reason of death, resignation, or incapacity, said vacancy shall be filed by, and we include the appointment of the mayor we included the words of said municipality within 90 calendar days in accordance with subsection 40124 of this chapter, or B, if there's a vacancy in the office of the mayor of said municipality, the vacancy in the MPC shall be established in accordance with subsection 40124 of this chapter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, Thank you, Madam wait. Speaker. I think- Are there any, yeah. any questions? Senator Tello. And then Mr. Senator Chair, Torres. can I just take a, you know, it's, it's a lot to read in here to try and digest. Um, okay. To accumulate. So can you give us about three minutes? Okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll move then to the question of Senator sure. Torres, then we'll okay, take a recess. You. Senator Torres. Mr. Chair, I, I recognize the importance of this amendment. Uh, it, in terms of the, the subject matter with regard to the Municipal Planning Council, but I, I respectfully request and object to this amendment and all other amendments that deal with the Municipal Planning Council
because I think at this point in time, Mr. Chair, we were assembled under an emergency uh, circumstance to address a vacancy and a void in a mayoral position. And I believe that this body has come very close to finalizing a reasonable solution to fulfilling that void. This amendment and other amendments that have to do with the Municipal Planning Council, I believe are matters for another time or can be matters for another time outside of this emergency session dealing with the void. So, you know, my, my feeling is that it, it is indeed, uh, these amendments are, are valid and they're reasonable and I think that they have good value going forward when we address municipal planning councils. But for, for the matter of today, under this guise of an emergency session and us wanting to arrive at a solution immediately to this situation in Jotnia, I think that all things that were done previously with regard to the amendments and what this body um, approved in the amendments and passed in the form of amendments will solve the issue that we attempted to solve when we convened today. So uh, with that long-winded recitation, I respectfully object to this and just ask the um, authors if, if perhaps we can introduce this in, a, in another bill form at another time so that it can be very thoroughly vetted, we can get input, and the proper composition of the mayor's council, municipal planning council, and all the things associated with their, the parameters of the MPC can be vetted, and perhaps uh, we can get some feedback also from the community about what really works in the scheme of Guam and throughout the villages. So um, that's just my, my two cents, and so I, Again, raise an objection. Thank you. Senator Nels, Madam Speaker? She raised an objection. Okay. Being it was requested that uh, we take a recess so our colleagues can di digest a little bit the, uh, the amendment. And I've been asked by the clerk that we take a five minute recess. I think they're gonna reset probably the, the system can I, actually, Mr. Chair, may I do, rise in a point of personal privilege? Yes. Just real quick. Mr. Chair, what we did here is we found we did away with the recall and we put in a temporary fix. Now, there were two end states or two concerns or maybe several, but the ones that stood out the most was one, we needed a, a fix the void, and then two, the policy is broken. And so here we're trying to fix the policy as well. If we come out of this legislature telling the people that we didn't give them the recall, but we gave them a temporary fix from an MPC that was appointed at such time, then it's, a, you know, you know where's, where's the good faith in that? And then we're not pr providing another solution so that this does not happen again. And so this is a, an attempt to, to make it right, to make it whole so that it doesn't happen again, and we brought a solution to the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank Chair, I'll, I'll withdraw my objection then. That, that's a valid point, and, and okay. I'll, I'll yield to the author. She took us this far, and I give her credit for that, and I want to offer my support. All right. We'll, we'll take a five minutes so the system can reset. Thank you. Five-minute recess.